So this is a problem from section 6.1. And as far as I can tell, it's not one of the ones that was assigned on WebAssign, but it's close enough to the one on, to the ones on WebAssign that I figured we could talk about it. Um, so in this question, we have the widths in meters of a kidney-shaped swimming pool. First of all, well, no, we'll just, it, it's a very weird question. I'm not sure why we care, but they were measured at two meter intervals as indicated in the figure. Use the midpoint rule to estimate the area of the pool. Um, so I am just gonna draw this lovely kidney shaped pool on my board um, and talk a little bit here about what we're being asked to do in this question and why I think it's dumb. Um, so, well, forgive my lovely artistry, but here is my rendition of that kidney shaped pool. Now, the first thing that we need to note is that you've been told that these were measured in two meter intervals. So that means the width of each of these things is two meters. The next part is you were told to use midpoint rule. Well, at least for this section, when you hear midpoint rule, you should think, throw out half of the data. That's right, because if we're gonna use the midpoint rule, then even though they gave us values at each of these, because they didn't tell us anything about what was going on in between, using the midpoint rule as a statement is equivalent to saying, don't use this measurement, essentially use every other measurement. So this one was lined up at 7.2, but don't use it. Use the one over here, that said 6.2 and pretend that it was a rectangle there at 6.2. For the next interval, don't use the 7.2, even though they gave it to you. Don't use the 5.6, even though they gave it to you. Only use the 6.8 and pretend that that's a rectangle right there. Well, so far what that means is this first rectangle actually has a width of four meters and a height of 6.2. This next piece has a width again of four meters and a height of 6.8. The next piece, there's a 5.6. We're not gonna use that, but we'll scoot over here and use the 5.0 and draw our rectangle in right there so that this piece has a width of four meters and a height of 5.0. We're not gonna use this 4.8 that they gave us, but we will use this one to draw our last rectangle here that has a width of four and a height of 4.8. To me, most of the problems in this section I think are dumb because if we took the time to actually make these measurements in person, we would never then go back and throw out half of the data. But to illustrate the point of the midpoint rule, that means that when we're looking at the problem, we're only going to use the middle value in each interval to make an estimate over the entire interval. So I hope that was helpful, like for that leaf problem and the airplane wing problem. Um, this is kind of the idea of what you're being asked to do when it says to use the midpoint. Okay. Um, last week, we're pretty much every example I did, I think, we drew a picture for it so that I could figure out what function was on the top and what function was on the bottom. That is typically how I'm going to approach each of these area problems. But what if you're not great at graphing or 
What if you just aren't confident in your graphing skills? So the truth is that we have a way to figure out who's on the top and who's on the bottom without actually sketching a graph or even a fake graph. So I thought I could show you guys that. For starters, if we're gonna find the area, then I know that we're gonna have to figure out where these things intersect. So I'm just gonna start there and figure out the intersection points. So if I set these two equal to each other, I've got x cubed minus 10x plus 25 is equal to 6x plus 25. I was obviously strategic here because in general factoring a cubic kind of sucks. But when we set these equal to each other, if I subtract 25 from both sides, the number part's gone, and then subtracting um, 6x over, I'm going to get x cubed minus 16x. And that's not so bad because I can pull an x out of each of these. And that happens to be the difference of two squares. So it factors pretty nicely. And there you go. I know these things are going to intersect at 0, 4, and negative 4. Well, thinking about it, and I, I said that I personally would draw a graph, this thing's a cubic, so it either goes like this or like this, and then we got a line slicing through it. So hopefully you can kind of imagine why we're going to end up with three intersection points. That means that if I put these in order, whatever else is happening on my graph, they intersect at negative four, they cross again at zero, and they cross again at four. And that has kind of defined two separate regions for us. And we need to know in each of those regions who's on top. So we were gonna do this without a graph. And the only way I know to do that is to plug in a number. So if I pick something between zero and four, and I, I'm gonna pick one, I just need to know at x equals 1, is the y value from the cubic bigger, or is the y value from the line bigger? So at x equals 1, I've got 1, plugging into the cubic, I have 1 minus 10, so I'm at negative 9, plus 25, 16. So f of 1 is 16. I plug in one over here, six plus 25, doesn't matter what it is, it's bigger than 16. So I know that in this region, I know my G is on top and my F is on the bottom. So I can already set up the integral for that piece of it. I know that from zero to four, I should have the line minus the cubic. I did not leave myself a lot of space here. I'll squeeze it in, but it's the line minus the cubic. And you'll notice I'm putting both of those in parentheses because I want to make sure that doing that subtraction that I'm going to end up to distribute out the minus sign. Now in this other region from negative four to zero, you would probably guess that the line is on top and you, I mean that the cubic is on top and you'd be right. But we can also check that one by picking a number over here so if I were to choose x equals negative 1, then f of negative 1 would be negative 1, negative 10 times negative 1. So it's plus a 10 and then plus 25. But if I do g of negative 1, I'd have negative 6 plus 25. So this top one is definitely bigger. So in this region between negative 4 and 0, we have the cubic minus the line. Should we actually figure this? Should we actually finish this off? How about you all finish it off on your papers? Sure, great idea. So I will actually write those integrals out neatly. So we're going to have the integral from negative 4 to 0 of x cubed minus 10x plus 25 minus our line, 6x plus 25. 
plus the integral from zero to four of our line, six X plus 25 minus the cubic, X cubed minus 10 X plus 25. We have a choice, but it seems to me like it's going to be way less work in terms of plugging in the numbers if we actually clean up these integrals and simplify what's inside before we start finding the antiderivatives. So for this first one, from negative 4 to 0, I've got that x cubed. And when I distribute this minus sign, then the 25s are going to go away. And the 10x minus 6x will give me a negative 16x. I'm going to integrate. x cubed is going to give me x to the fourth over 4. And then here, I'll have x squared. And when we divide by 2, I'll end up with 8x squared. And that's going from negative 4 to 0. Over here, when we distribute that minus sign through, I'm going to end up with, well, I'll have 6x minus a negative 10x. So that's a total of 16x. My 25 minus 25 will go away just like it did before. And I'll have a negative x cubed. When I integrate that, that 16x is going to give me an 8x squared and minus 1 fourth x to the fourth. And we're going from 0 to 4 over here. Sorry, I got a little off. Here, I'm going to plug in. I'm always going to plug in the top number first. So when I plug in 0, 0 to the fourth is 0. 8 times 0 squared is 0. So I have 0 minus, when we plug in negative 4, negative 4 raised to the fourth, that minus a minus a minus a minus will loop back around to being positive. So I'm just going to write this as 4 to the, oops, I was simplifying my head. Let me not do that. That's going to be 4 to the fourth divided by 4. When I plug in the negative 4 and square it, that's going to be 8 times 16. We'll come back and deal with the numbers in a minute if we need to. Over here, when I plug in the 4, I'm going to have 8 times 4 squared, or 8 times 16. And when I plug in the 4 here, I'll have minus um, 4 to the 4th over 4. And I'm looking at that whole thing minus plugging in 0. So if I distribute this minus sign through, first of all, 4 to the 4th divided by 4 is 4 cubed. And 4 cubed, 4 times 4 is 16, and then times another 4 is 64. So I've got a negative 64 minus a minus, that's going to be plus. Now, 8 times 16 is not a number I know off the top of my head. But if I had to do this without a calculator, I would actually take that 8 and think about it as 2 times 4. Because 4 times 16, I know that number. That's 64. And 64 times 2 is 128. So if I had to do that without a calculator, that's how it would break it up. Over here, I'm going to have exactly those same numbers. So the 8 times 16, we just figured out was 128. And this becomes another 4 cubed, so minus 64. So 128 minus 64 gives me 64, plus another 128 minus 64. So in total, I get 100 and 28. And we will need the intersection points. But this, for me, is a classic case of where I'm at least going to think about a fake graph. That's a parabola. 
And that minus sign in front of the x squared tells me that it's one of these kind of parabolas. This is also a parabola, but the positive invisible one in front of the x squared tells me it's one of these kind of parabolas. So no matter what else is going on, y1 has to be on the top and y2 has to be on the bottom, just by the shape of their graphs. But to come up with the actual integral, I'm going to have to set them equal to each other. Setting these equal to each other, sure. Negative x squared plus 4x plus 63 is equal to x squared plus 12x plus, oh, I didn't mean 36. Can I, can I change my mind and make that 39? I was trying to choose things that are going to factor nicely in the end. Does not really matter which side we want to move everything to to get the zero, except that my brain works better factoring wise if the coefficient on the x squared is positive. I'm going to choose, therefore, to move all of this stuff to the right. So I'm going to add x squared to both sides. So I'll have 2x squared. I'm going to subtract 4x from both sides. And I'm going to subtract 63 for both sides. And 39 minus 63 should give me a negative 24. From here, if I'm going to solve that, I'm going to choose to factor it. And the first thing I can do is to factor a 2 out. And then I'd have x squared plus 4x minus 12. My general advice with factoring is, for me, it's faster to factor this. For you, if factoring isn't really your thing, I just want to know, I just want to make sure that you know you can always use quadratic formula. It's a little more time consuming if the numbers work out nice, but it'll always work. So if you're sitting there struggling with how to factor some sort of quadratic, just throw it in quadratic formula, get a number, move on. I need factors of 12 that differ by four. So that is gonna be six and two. And I know that because this term is positive, I need the larger of the two factors to be positive. So these are gonna intersect at x equals negative six, and again at x equals two. So I don't know what else is going on in the picture, but this should be at negative six, and this should be at x equals 2. Putting that together to write an integral for this area, we've got our top function, that negative x squared plus 4x plus 63. And we're subtracting off that bottom function, x squared plus 12x plus 39. And I know we should be integrating from negative 6 to 2. And just like with the last one, because I know I'm going to have a definite integral and I have to plug numbers in the, at the end, I don't really want to plug numbers into six separate terms if I can avoid it. So instead, I'm going to combine this stuff together first. And doing that, I've got negative x, distributing that minus sign out. It's going to turn that into a negative 2x and then 4x minus 12x and 63 minus 39. Now, if you do this correctly, whatever you get here is always either going to be the thing you already solved for when you were finding the intersection points or exactly the opposite of the thing you solved for. Because I mentioned here we had a choice of whether to move all the stuff to this side or move all the stuff to this side. So that is what we would have gotten if we had moved everything to the other side. Doesn't matter, that part was just the solving for algebra. Down here it matters because we have to keep our top function minus our bottom function. We're ready to find that antiderivative. I add one to the exponent, I'll be at x cubed, divide by the new exponent. 
So I'll have negative two thirds x cubed minus, that'll be squared and then divide by two. It's gonna give me eight x squared and then plus a 24 x. We're taking all of that from negative six to two. Okay, we can fight through these numbers if we really want to. I'm gonna plug in the two and subtract off plugging in the negative six. So if I plug in the two, I'm gonna have two cubed is eight times two is 16. So negative 16 thirds. Two squared is four, eight times four, 32. Two times 24, 48. We're gonna have that whole thing minus, and then plugging in the negative six. And I'm out. I don't know what six cubed is. I probably would if I thought about it. Um, I'm not gonna think about it. I'm just gonna rate this as negative two thirds times negative six cubed minus eight times negative six squared plus 24 times negative six. And I'm gonna walk away. Given time, energy, and sufficient monetary motivation, I am confident that you could turn that into one nice number. We have a choice of where to start, but I know eventually I'm gonna need those limits of integration. So I might as well figure out where they intersect. And I think I've got space to squeeze it in here. So if I set x squared equal to six plus x, I tried to give us something that would factor. So x squared minus x minus six, I think is gonna factor as x minus three times x plus two. So that means over here, I've got a negative three and over here, oh, how about the other way around? Over here, I've got a negative two and over here, I've got a positive three. Now, there are two different ways that we can rate this volume, but because what I'm rotating around does not touch exactly one of the edges of this shape, when I spin it, we're kind of going to get this thing that, I don't know, I don't have a good real life object that looks like that. Maybe some fancy glass on its side or something. But in any event, it's going to have this sort of hollowed out part. And because it's got that hollowed out part, I'm going to set this up as pi times a big radius squared times my thickness minus pi times a small radius squared times the thickness. Now in terms of those two radii, my big radius, little radius, I'm always going to start at the axis of rotation. So if I start at the axis of rotation and I go until I hit my cross section, then that small radius that we hit is coming from the y equals x squared. So that's what I'll have over here x squared squared. And for my larger radius, I'm going to start at my axis of rotation and go until I hit the outside edge. And that outer edge is coming from my line. So I'll end up with pi times that line, 6 plus x, whole thing squared. And for both of those, I'd be taking those cross sections as far to the left as negative 2 and as far to the right as positive 3. Just like any of our other integrals we've been doing today, I'm going to simplify each of those before I try to find the antiderivative. So here, simplifying that really means I'm going to multiply it out. I'll have pi and we're going from negative 2 to 3. The other thing that I'll say is we can now squish the whole thing back into a single integral as long as we take care of that minus sign and making sure to square this first. So over here, if I multiply that out, I'd have 36 plus 12x plus x squared. 
and x squared squared is going to give me an x to the fourth. And I'll end up with pi times 36x plus 6x squared plus 1 third x cubed minus 1 fifth x to the fifth whole thing from negative 2 to 3. And I'm going to quit there because I'm out of board space. But you'd plug in the 2 and then subtract off plugging it. Sorry, I keep pointing at this 3 and calling it 2. You'd plug in the 3 and then subtract off plugging in the negative 2. The version is, there's a formula for this. My slightly longer version of this is, you already know what the formula is. So how do you find the average of a whole bunch of numbers? You add them up and divide by the number of numbers, right? So if I had 6, 8, 7, 9, and 5, and you wanted to find the average, you would add them up and divide by 5, because there are five things in my list. Well, interpreting that calculus style, if I had a function like um, one plus e to the negative two t, um, on t from, let's say t was going from zero to five, then that same idea of add them all up and divide by the number of numbers turns into, well, adding them up calculus style means I'm going to find the integral. So if I want the average value, of f, sorry, I wrote t's, but I wrote that as an x, of f of t on 0 to 5. I'm going to add them all up, meaning we're going to take the integral from 0 to 5 of 1 plus e to the negative 2t. And then I'm going to divide by the number of numbers. Well, my interval width here is from 0 to 5, so I'm going to divide by 5 minus 0, or that interval width. In general, when I'm finding this average value, the average value of f of x is going to look like 1 over b minus a times the integral from a to b of f of x dx. And that's what my average value is going to look like. Sometimes we write that as an f with a bar on the top for the average value. So let's actually find the average value of my function. Um, so if I'm going to take this integral, or first of all, 5 minus 0, I can do in my head. That's 5. So I'm going to write that as 1 fifth. And then we're looking at this integral and the antiderivative of one with respect to t, I'm gonna get a t. And the antiderivative of e to the negative two t, I'm gonna have that same e to the negative two t, but we'll divide by negative two. And that's going from zero to five. So I'd be looking at one fifth times, plugging in five, I get five, minus, and I'm going to write that 1 over negative 2 instead as a negative 1 half, e to the negative 10th minus me plugging in 0. And plugging in 0, I get 0 minus negative 1 half times e to the 0, and e to the 0 is 1. So that's it. So I've got 1 fifth times 5 minus a minus will make that plus. So 5 minus 1 half e to the negative 10 plus 1 half. 